Unit 5, Jewelry and Fashion Module 1, Introduction to the Language of Jewelry Hello and welcome to Fashion Accessories and Trims. This is Unit 5 of this course which introduces us to the language of jewelry. Through the course of this unit, we will examine jewelry and adornments and their relationship with fashion, culture and of course the human body. In addition to detailing Western jewellery, this unit also includes traditional Indian accessories and jewellery. In this module 1 of the unit 5, we will attempt to understand the introduction to the language of jewellery. In this module, we will discuss the factors that influence the practice and the business of jewellery. The word jewellery is said to have come from the French word jewel, which roughly translates to plaything. Jewelry can be divided into precious, semi-precious and costume jewelry. Precious jewelry involves the usage of precious metals like platinum, gold and precious gemstones like ruby, emerald, diamond and sapphire, the four precious stones. Semi-precious category is largely made up of silver and even plated metals along with semi-precious stones and beads. Pieces manufactured as ornamentation to complete a particular costume, a garment or even an accessory is known as costume jewellery. This is an introduction that we have already come across in Unit 1. In this module, of Unit 5, which focuses on the language of jewellery. We will discuss the factors that influence both the practice as well as the business of jewellery. I will introduce to you the visual, material, non-material culture of jewellery. We will desert the art of wearing jewellery with respect to society and culture. We will list the techniques of jewellery making. We will also study the development of costume jewellery through ages. Before we begin, I would once again like to draw your attention to Unit 1, Module 1 of this course, which I suggest as recommended reading. This Unit 1, Module 1 will serve as the foundation to Unit 5. Jewelry and Culture By definition, jewelry comprises of small ornamental items like rings, earrings, brooches, necklaces or pendants for personal adornment. However, the scope of jewelry goes much beyond that. An engagement ring or wedding ring, while still a ring, carry the promise of love and being together. Just as an iPhone or a MacBook is symbolic of the digital culture of the times, a piece of jewellery is reflective of the times as well. When was it made? Who made it and for whom? What materials and forms are used? What impact do these have on the maker, the buyer, the wearer and yes the viewer? These are questions that must be asked and answered in an attempt to understand any designed object including that of jewellery. This brings us to a very important topic in the design industry. The practice of design and the business of design. The practice and business of jewellery design. On examining several factors, I found that both the practice as well as the business of jewellery and fashion are invariably influenced by the same agents. They can be broadly classified in three categories. Human emotion, that is human want, emotions and need. Second, culture. Culture includes tradition, heritage and practice. And finally, trends. Now let me attempt to elaborate 
each one of these points. Firstly, let us look at human emotion. As human beings, we all want to be beautiful. We want to stay young and fit. We want to be loved and respected. We want power and the ability to influence. We want wealth and the ability to showcase it. We want the best. We want to be the best. Now personal adornments like jewelry check most of the above boxes. The right piece or pieces of jewelry can make us not only look but also feel powerful, feel youthful and yes feel beautiful. A piece of jewelry received as a gift can be a symbol of love. Human emotion and want is both directed by culture as well as by trends which leads us to studying the second and the most important component that decides both the practice as well as the business of fashion. Culture. Culture is a potent combination of language, norms, values, beliefs and all that put together that forms the people's way of life. The culture basket includes cultural or traditional practices that define the role of a person in a community or that which gives them identity. It includes visual, material, non-material, verbal and digital culture. In this module, we will be looking specifically at visual, material and non-material culture with respect to jewellery. Visual culture. Visual culture is a buzzword today. What does it mean? To understand that, we have to first understand what is vision. Vision is not merely seeing, nor is it just eyesight. Vision is a cultural construction. It is learned and cultivated. And it is simply not eyesight that is just given by nature. It is deeply involved with the study of human societies, the ethics and politics, aesthetics and epistemology of seeing and yes, being seen. Visual rhetoric of jewelry. By definition, rhetoric refers to the study and uses of a written, spoken, or a visual language. It deals with how the language is used to construct meanings, identities, organize and maintain social groups, coordinate behavior, mediate power, produce change and create knowledge. Thus, rhetoric by definition is an act of persuasion. Rhetoric by nature concerns the particular and the probable. It requires invention and judgment and involves arrangement in space and time as well. Now, if you look closely, this is true for design as well. If rhetoric by this explanation is design, can it be used to understand the nuances of design? Yes, of course. In the context of jewellery, visual rhetoric plays an important role. The colours, materials, shapes and forms can create an identity. They can help maintain social order through distinction. They can persuade the buyer, user or viewer to look at the object in a particular way or make their own decisions. A crown or a tiara gives the impression of royalty and power. Thus, when a person wears a tiara, they are seen as being superior to those around them. Case in point, consider the beauty pageants where the winner is crowned. To give you another example, 
long linear forms, rectangles and bulky shapes give the impression of masculine industrial feel to a piece while thin curvy lines make it look complex and feminine. This is one of the reasons why a majority of watches meant for women have smaller shaped dials as compared to those meant for men. So just by sight we are able to gauge the gender of the wearer just by looking at the shape, size, color of the object. While pink phones, pink watches and even pink cars made by considered sexist, there is some sort of psychoanalysis and study that goes beyond the selection of color, shapes and forms of each of these products. Now, the visual aspects by alone cannot be taken into consideration while looking at a product. The context and background heavily impact the meaning as well. An Indian, that is a Hindu bride, is dead from head to toe and is the embodiment of colour and shine, that is the image of prosperity, that is the image of Goddess Lakshmi. If you now remove the flowers from her head, the jewellery and mute the colour of her sari, she supposedly looks less of a bride. We might not be able to accept her as a traditional bride. Now compare this to the American notion of a Christian bride. She wears a plain white dress and very little jewellery along with subtle makeup. Though her ensemble might be kotor and very expensive, it nevertheless looks simple visually. Now for a minute, close your eyes and consider interchanging their looks visually in your imagination. Will the visual argument by itself persuade the viewers of the bridal status of each of these brides in their respective regions? Now let me give you another example at a detailed level. Most of us might have bangles, rings or earrings that are studded with stones and after a period of time a stone goes missing. Now this bangle or a ring with a stone missing may be considered tacky at a modern black tie event and it shows the wearer in bad light. But when worn amidst collectors and curators, it is prized for it shows that the piece has been previously loved, yes worn, and hence comes with its share of stories. In the first instance, the missing stone may be linked to the wearer's financial status or simply his or her indifference in taking care of the piece. But in the later, it shows character. Jewelry can also be used to change both the visual and physical appearance of a person. Jewelry such as earrings can frame the face better. Long necklaces can make the wearer look taller. Women of the Khaen Lavi tribe or now the Karen Hill tribe in Chiang Mai are well known for wearing neck rings to elongate their neck. Women in some communities in Tamil Nadu used to wear pambadam earrings to elongate their earlobes. This is known as body modification through jewellery. Though an aspect of visual culture, it brings us closer to what we are going to discuss next, that is material culture. Material culture refers to the physical objects, resources and spaces that people use to define their culture. As identity is of paramount importance in older cultures, clothing and jewellery form a very big part of the material culture of a community. 
jewelry is considered to be a portable form of culture. You have the opportunity of wearing a piece or packing it and taking it along with you even if you have to migrate to another region, country or even a continent. It has the possibility of being passed down generations as heirlooms and is thus considered to be wearable heritage. Now let us take a look at different societies in history. The jewelry worn in medieval Europe reflected the intensely hierarchical nature of the society. In 529 AD, Emperor Justinian regulated the wearing and the usage of jewelry in a set of laws called the Justinian Code. Why the royalty and nobility wore gold and silver. Commoners wore base metals such as copper, brass or pewter. Christian iconography in the form of crosses and enameled saint images used as pendant and pectoral jewellery were a common sight in the Byzantine period. Colour in jewellery was a status symbol and therefore colour gemstones and cloison enamelling were much in vogue from the Middle Ages even till the Renaissance. In the past, Indian men from rich Brahmin families or trading communities would wear diamond studs in both years as a status marker. Kundan, Meenakari and Polki jewellery of Western India demonstrate the splendour with which the Rajputs and the Mughals lived. Similarly, the word Nizam conjures up the image of a king decked up in emeralds, diamonds and pearls. From the traditional Indian Kasamale coin necklace and lark filled dowry beads to the strands of multicolour wedding beads worn by the Mali people, several cultures literally wear their wealth around their neck. The Banjara tribes of India wear ornaments with coins much like the tribes of Yemen. Misnamed as Afghani jewellery, these pieces are replete with coins and coloured glass stones. A conservative African Zulu bride-to-be makes two sets of bead necklaces in matching colours, one for herself and one for her groom-to-be. Their matching colour-coded bracelets or necklaces will let others know of their intention to wed. A Fulani bride wears large twisted gold hoop earrings that she receives from her mother as dowry. Much like how a South Indian Brahmin bride wears a pair of diamond earrings. From all these examples, you can see how these materials, these ornaments dictate and are dictated by the practices of the particular community. Now ornaments as wearable heritage can be studied as the evidence of the civilization. We also come to know the skills of the artisans during the period and yes their aesthetics. The beads found in Harappan settlements enable us to understand the complexity in the skill level of the artisans of the period. The influence of vegetal representations of Islamic art can be found in Meenakhari jewellery. While the motifs look Islamic, the product as a whole looks Hindu due to the rich clothing and the colours that it is worn with. The Thali and the Mangal Sutra of India are full of symbolism. Essentially, these are fertility symbols, but they also denote denote the caste, sect and region from where the woman hails. Pieces of jewellery also work as metaphors. A belt is a symbol of strength and protection. Hindu prayer beads 
Christian Rosary and the Greek Columboi are symbolic of the religious nature of these communities where they come from and where they are used. Flowers and hearts, two of the most common motifs in jewellery, represent prosperity, happiness and love. Now, if you look at symbolism in jewellery as metaphors, you do not have to go further than a finger ring. A finger ring is a continuous circle symbolizing the promise of togetherness for eternity. Hence, it is presented during a marriage proposal. While some ornaments like finger rings have universal meanings, other items like nose rings, bracelets and anklets differ in meaning from culture to culture across the world. Bracelets and anklets in some cultures represent slavery or submissiveness, while in others they are symbols of festivity and cheer. The symbolism and meaning must not be read in isolation, but in conjunction with the non-material culture of the particular community. Non-material culture The intangible factors of a culture, that is, non-physical aspects like value system, belief, norms, hierarchy, organization, language, and systems together is known as non-material culture. But these aspects influence the way the materials and the objects that are used by the people in this community are made, sold, collected, used. And yes, the influence goes vice versa too. Ancient Egyptians collected gold to be buried with them for their afterlife. Cowboys incorporate horse hair into their cuffs to show their bond with their favorite animal. They also wore cords with bullets as pendants as a mark of their bravery during a shootout. Amulets are worn to protect the wearer during travel or sickness and can be commonly found in communities that have such beliefs. Talismans, on the other hand, are used around the world for good luck. You must have definitely heard of the phrase, good luck charm. While the charm or talisman by itself is a material, a product, the belief that an object might bring luck makes it the part of the wearer's value system. As the value system of a society changes, the material culture also changes along with it. So these two are not mutually exclusive. Today, even when more and more people are talking about sustainability, we are honestly a use and throw culture. This means that we want to wear something new, something in trend, that can be bought for a cheaper price and replaced with another object the next season or the next year. Thus, lesser quality of materials or lesser skill in production becomes the norm. On the other side, there are people who have become serious collectors. They are looking for the real thing. Antique heirlooms that have been made and used decades or even centuries ago. With the digital influence coming in strongly, people are looking to confirm by standing out. Now more than ever, as individualism reigns supreme, artisan jewelry, handmade jewelry stands to benefit. Trends as we have been talking about the growth and the changes in communities and their cultures, the word trend comes into forefront. Fashion trends, as we know, are influenced or impacted by geographical, socio-cultural, 
political and technological factors. The act of buying or wearing jewellery and the degree of purchase corresponds to the idea of creation, storage, growth, distribution, use and display of wealth that exist at a particular point of time in that society. Industrial standards, beliefs of the community and peer support all factor in to convert a minor event into a major trend. Here are some examples to further illustrate this point. Memorial jewellery reached a new high during Queen Victoria's rule as she wore mourning jewellery to mourn the passing of Prince Albert. She also brought back cameos in fashion from the Roman times. The preference for white and light shades in jewellery including the use of pearls, diamonds, silver and platinum reached its peak during the age of innocence as a reaction to the suffragettes movement in the west. Not many people know that this is a reason for the popularity of silver and platinum jewellery along with pearls and diamonds in the west even today. The bold, colourful, geometrical aesthetics of the Art Deco movement provided a background for colourful plastics to be used alongside metal in jewellery. Fashion is cyclical and thus often repeats. In the last 10 years, we have seen many instances of 20s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 80s jewellery even 90s chokers coming back into fashion. In the 20th and 21st century, cinema played and still plays the biggest influencer of fashion trends. The 1996 movie Craft skyrocketed the popularity of rosary beads as jewellery worn along with elongated, often upside down crosses as pendants or even as earrings. After Titanic released, several reproductions of the famous diamond and sapphire heart of the ocean necklace were made and sold. Till date, the necklace is commonly referred to as Titanic necklace. In India, movies like Jodha Akbar revitalized the Kundan and Polki industry in India. Recently, the movie Bahubali has led to the revival of traditional jewellery ornaments like the Gutta Pusilu necklaces. The current trend in jewellery includes wearable technology, mixed media jewellery and yes, conceptual jewellery. We should wait and watch to see how this exciting mix of human want, trends and yes, culture shapes, the colors, motifs, forms, patterns and even techniques of jewellery making in the coming future. Techniques of jewellery making Since the objective of this module is to give you an introduction of the language of jewellery, it is pertinent that we understand a few basic jewellery making techniques. There are several techniques that are available in jewellery making with variations and specializations. Here are a few of them under broad headings. Stringing. It is a process of filling up a string or any material with beads, components, spacers, focals and pendants. The end of the string must be knotted or crimped to a closure or the string must be knotted on to itself in order to create a wearable product. Stringing is the most commonly used jewellery making technique in the world and something that is followed 
by beginners across the world. The second technique that we are going to discuss is the oldest jewelry making technique that is knotting. Knotting and braiding. Knotting is one of the oldest jewelry making techniques like I mentioned and it's commonly used in pearls and in the creation of gemstone bead jewelry. Apart from simple knots, jewelry can also be created using macrame knots or the kumihimo technique of braiding. The art of stringing and knotting together or often interchangeably in India is traditionally known as piroi. Looping. It is the process of joining two beads, connectors or components by the way of a wire loop or two loops using a ring. The loops can be simple, wrapped or messy. This technique provides a stronger and more durable product than stringing. Bead weaving. Bead weaving refers to the process of weaving beads. It can be done on a loom much like a textile or off the loom using a thread and a beading needle. Seed beads, drop beads and buggle beads are typically used in this technique. It can be used to create strips of beads like a netting, tubes, beaded beads and several other shapes. Piote and draw that is right angle weave are the most commonly used stitches. Wire work. Wire work is the umbrella term for jewelry that is made using wire. It includes looped and wrapped beaded pieces to soldered wire earrings, rings and bangles. It includes coiling and wrapping to create base structures with wire. Complex techniques like wire knitting, an example being Viking knit, to wire crochet can be done as well. Chain mail is another technique where the wire is first drawn, made into jump rings and then woven together to create an entire base fabric or a particular shape that is desired. Soldered wire settings can also be used as bezels for gem setting. Soldering. The process of joining ends of base metal wire or two pieces of metal sheet using a solder joint is known as soldering. While small joints can be done using a soldering iron, metal jewellery is typically soldered using a torch. Solder and flux are the most important ingredients that are required to create a soldering joint. Metal smithing. Metal smithing is the area that concerns with metal jewellery making. It includes casting, forming, forging, embossing, chasing and texturing techniques. Now metal jewellery making can be divided in several ways. Even jewellery made using metal wire comes under metal jewellery making. Metal can be melted, carpoured, casted to create pieces. Sheet metal can also be folded, formed, chased or embossed in order to create ornaments. Basic activities in metal jewellery making include annealing to soften the metal, cutting with shears or sawing, drilling holes, filing and sanding, forming using hammers, riveting, soldering and finally finishing. Finishing apart from antiquing and colouring that we will see below also includes sanding, buffing and polishing. 
the final step is often sealing when it comes to costume jewelry. Casting and molding. While the terms casting and molding are used in the context of metal jewelry, where the metal is melted and poured in a mold for casting, as in the lost wax process. These techniques can be used with other materials as well. Materials like clay, cement and resin can also be pressed or poured into molds for casting. These do not require heat, that is the amount of heat that is required for metal casting and the molds can be reused after a cast. New age silicon molds are commonly used for casting with epoxy clay and resin. Embossing, Riposé and Chasing Riposé is a metal working technique in which a malleable metal is ornamented or shaped by hammering from the reverse side to create a design in low relief. Chasing is the opposite technique to repose, where the piece is hit from the front side to create more prominent lines and markings in the piece. The two are used in conjunction to create a finished piece of metal surface in this technique. This technique is also sometimes used as embossing. In chasing and repose and in embossing, the difference lies in the tools that are being used and the pressure that is given in order to make an impression. Repose is not only a common method of ornamentation in Europe, it is also commonly found in Asia. Repose work in India is known as Naghas work and can be seen in silver utensils and in temple jewelry ornaments. Filigree Filigree is a technique in which thin, pliable threads or strips of precious metal are twisted or curled into a design and then soldered to create almost an open lacework pattern. Filigree in India is known as Tarkashi. Silver Tarkashi is very famous in Orissa and the region surrounding it, whereas gold filigree work can be seen in the traditional gold jewellery of Kolkata. The technique of filigree is said to have been introduced in India by the Greek. Plating and anodizing. Electroplating is the process of coating one metal, usually a base metal, with another more precious metal using electricity. For example, copper can be plated with silver or gold plating can be done on silver. Gold plated silver is one of the most commonly used techniques for higher end costume jewelry in India. Materials can also be simply coated rather than plated to achieve a particular color or a finish. You might see this in gold jewellery pieces where slivers of a silverish colour is visible on the yellow gold surface. Now we have to remember that neither coating nor plating permanently changes the structure of the base material. These are only surface treatments and coating is even more temporary as compared with plating. Anodizing on the other hand, is an electrochemical process that uses an acid electrolyte bath and an electric current to change the surface of the metal. It changes the surface 
by making it thicker and or by coloring it. Metals like aluminium, titanium and niobium are ideal for this process. You can find brightly colored anodized aluminium wires that are suitable for making costume jewelry. Similarly, beautiful metallic looking niobium wires as they are hypoallergenic can be worn by almost everybody even those who are allergic to metal. These come in a plethora of colors and are meant to coordinate with your attire. Color in metal is an exciting concept. Therefore, the next technique that we are going to look at is coloring and antiquing. In metal jewelry, the base color can be changed using the application of colorants like inks or patina. Swagelin paste, wind touch patina inks are two of the most commonly used colorants in the costume jewelry industry. Patina typically adds an aged look and this process is known as antiquing. Patina can be introduced naturally or with agents like the liver of sulfur which helps speed up the process. It can also be done using an array of chemicals which each lend a particular color to the piece. Apart from making silver an almost blackish color, the same patina or the same agent can react differently on different surfaces. While a liver of sulfur on clean silver or copper can blacken it. On brass, it can make the metal look more golden. Patina can also be added using fire. This process is known as fire painting or flame painting. Usually done on copper, this not only darkens the piece but also provides almost a rainbow film on the surface of the metal. Enameling. Through the course of this module, you might have come across this word enamel and enameling multiple times. What is this? Enameling. By enameling here, I refer to vitreous enameling. Vitreous enameling is the process of adding color to a metal ornament or a surface by fusing powdered glass on its surface. The glass is fired at high temperature, either using a clin or a jeweler's torch. Champelev, Cloison and Graffito are some commonly used enameling techniques. Contemporary enamelists also use new techniques like crackle enamel to add more texture to their pieces. Application of enamel paints, inks and other colorants is not considered as true enameling. Enameling in India is commonly known as Meena work or Meena Khari. This brings us to gem and stone setting. Stone setting is the act of securely setting or mounting a stone, usually a gemstone on a metal base. The setting could be formed with wire as an open back bezel or it can have a flat back surface where in which there is a metal plate at the back. Now the type of setting depends upon the type of stone. Stones are usually either carbochins or they have faceted back which ends in a point depending on the shape of the stone and the method in which it has been cut the setting must be prepared the common types of settings are prong pave bezel and channel stones apart from metal can also be set in epoxy clay 
and air dried, or set in metal clay and fired in the clin to get beautiful pieces of handmade jewellery. Miscellaneous techniques. Like I mentioned early on when giving an introduction to the jewellery making techniques, I mentioned that there are a variety of techniques that are there in this segment. The 14 that I listed above barely scratch the surface. Today in the era of mixed media jewellery, techniques that are used to make other products are often incorporated into jewellery making. There are several materials that can be used to create jewellery. With these materials, the techniques also vary. Textile techniques like weaving, crochet, knitting, macrame and braiding can be used for textile based pieces. Wood turning, lacquer work, inlay work, pyrography and decoupage can be used for wood, metal, leather and even paper jewellery. The type of technique depends upon not just the material being used but also your design, the form that you want to create, the use, the wearability, durability, all will enable you to pick the right technique for your design and eventually your piece of jewellery. Now this module on introduction to the language of jewellery will be incomplete if we did not look at the development of costume jewellery through the ages. Yes, my dear friends, let me once more like before in all the other units take you through the history and evolution of costume jewellery. As before, I have divided this into two sections. History and evolution of costume jewellery in the West and in India. History and evolution of costume jewellery in the West. The prehistoric man wore teeth, bones, claws and furs of animals and even maybe shells knotted together as jewellery. Soon these were polished into beads with holes drilled in them and strung along with abalone and mother of pearl. Slowly, seeds, reeds and grass, quills and feathers were incorporated to create expressive pieces that stood as status markers and as symbols of power. The discovery of metals such as copper, bronze, silver and gold meant that jewellery could take many more forms. It could be made into bands and scrolls and it could be used to wire other pieces. The ability to melt and cast metal enabled plentiful forms of adornment that were previously considered impossible. Ancient Egyptians wore plentiful pottery beads and those made of wood, bone and even ivory. Stones such as lapis lazuli and turquoise along with coral were used. Greek women are said to have decorated their hair with flowers, berries and ribbons. And they also used fibula made from bone, metal and yes even ivory. The Romans wore signet rings which had intagio carnelians. They freely combined glass with gold, vitreous enameling, the technique that I described just before, was used to add colour and value to ornaments both in the Roman and in the Byzantine era. Now looking at other places in Europe, Venetian glass gems and pearls that were created using the Murano technique were prized not only in Europe but also in Africa. You might have heard stories of slave beads or people 
being exchanged for beads. Recipes for false pearls existed in the 1300s when white powdered glass mixed with albumen of egg white and snail slime produced beads that were used as imitation pearls. Women in Armenia and Amman wore headpieces in silver with chains and coins. Coral and turquoise stones were also studded on ornaments apart from glass stones. On the other side of India, you could also see very similar ornaments being worn till date in Nepal and Tibet. In the 1700s, paste was used to create rhinestones. This opened up a huge market which could create pieces of blingy jewelry. Due to the industrial revolution, steel became easily available and it was used to set jasper cameos. Jet was set into mourning pieces worn by Queen Victoria after Prince Albert's death as I had mentioned once before. All types of materials that were black were used and a lot of them included a lock of the dead loved one's hair in the form of memorial jewelry. Due to the impact of the suffragette movement, colors like green, pink and white became popular and women wore delicate brooches, necklaces and earrings in these colors, particularly in green, to support the movement. Talking about movements, we cannot ignore the several art and design movements that contributed to the evolution of jewelry. The arts and crafts movement and Art Nouveau brought about the use of botanical forms in silver along with enamel and semi-precious stones. The Art Deco period saw widespread use of plastics like Bakelite, Lysite and Vulcanite. Coco Chanel's iconic four pearl necklaces gave a new meaning to style in the 20th century. Blingy Diamante juxtaposed with liberal usage of pearls was the predominant style statement of the period. The Jazz Age also gave rise to chrome jewellery. During the World War II, sterling silver was often incorporated into costume jewellery as the components used for the base metals were needed for wartime production. Till date, sterling silver is a big part of costume jewellery and not many know why, when and how did this practice exactly begin and now you know how. In the 1960s, fueled by the space age aesthetics, bold colourful jewellery made out of lucite, perspex and plexiglass all became popular. These were augmented on the previously discovered plastics that were used in the 1930s. The later 60s and 70s returned to the roots with bohemian necklaces and beaded bracelets. Peace symbols were commonly used as pendants and charms. They were knotted, braided necklaces with macrame tassels during the hippie movement. The 80s once again with all its consumer demands invented big bold plastic jewelry along with colored and white rhinestones worn along with big shouldered garments these gave off a symbol or an emotion of feeling powerful and beautiful in the last 30 years there has been a huge growth in the costume jewelry market with brands and designers creating high-end pieces. Their popularity has led to numerous mass-produced copies that are easily affordable and better still available, leading to a greater acceptance of costume jewelry. Technologically advanced wearable jewelry is also on the rise. 
you now have pendants and earrings that can connect to your iPhone or to your smart watch. On the other hand, the 2008 makers movement and the subsequent years have put artisan jewellery in the spotlight. This is an opposition to the mass-produced so-called designer jewellery. Carefully handmade from glass, clay, resin, textiles and metal and all of the above to get put together, these pieces of jewellery are made by the artist piece by piece in their studios and are not mass produced. Therefore, these are the most important eye objects of desire in the 21st century. History and evolution of Indian costume jewelry. As I promised before, this entire unit will have a lot of references from Indian jewelry and our traditions. Contrary to popular notion that circulates in the West, that costume jewellery began only 300 years ago. Indians have always worn costume jewellery. They have worn it since the Harappan period, where along with pearls, glass beads and terracotta beads were freely worn. Texts like Ramayana state that Lord Rama Sita and Lakshmana wore wooden jewellery and Rudraksh beads on their exile. Ancient India was a stone bead culture and records exist of Mauryans wearing etched stone beads. Shakuntala's flower jewellery as described by Kavi Kalidasa in Abhikhyanaya Shakuntalam in the later ages adds further proof to the love that Indians had for organic costume jewellery. At Papanaidu pit near Arikamedu, tiny black seeds were produced for jewellery purposes since 2nd century BC up until a few years ago. Unfortunately, today nobody knows how it can be made. Throughout history, Indian kings have worn anteater claws and tiger tooth to demonstrate their valor and ivory to demonstrate their wealth. Sarpech of many kings have slots to hat feathers of herons and the other birds that they hunt. Lak bangles, grass bangles and earrings, seed jewelry, cholapit mukhut and topor, tassels of seed beads, glass bangles, and cowrie shells form the Indian repertoire of jewellery. Sandalwood, Tulsi and Rudraksh Mala are worn till date as well. Strings of red coral beads are worn by women and children to keep chest cold at bay. Newborn children are adorned with Vasambu bangles to ward off cold. Pachikam made with uncut precious stones or even glass on a silver base in western India and Vadaseri Kim which also includes colored glass in gold plated base or even silver base in South India are traditional Indian jewelry styles that are based on costume jewelry. While precious versions of these exist, the costume counterparts are given priority and are worn during cultural events, festivals and marriages. India is also impacted by the knockoff culture in the West and the availability of mass-produced cheap copies of designer jewellery in China has made our market a big consumer of costume jewellery in the last 25 years. It has developed to such an extent where brides prefer to wear grand sets of copper or pyotr jewellery set with rhinestones or coloured with enamels as opposed to simpler gold jewellery. Despite this boom, the homemade artisan culture is thriving as well. Apart from terracotta, polymer clay, textile, wood and resin jewellery, 
people are making and selling mixed media pieces as well. Conceptual jewelry is becoming the buzzword where each piece tells a story or conveys an emotion. Theta jewelry in India. There is also an extraordinary culture of theta jewelry in India where large headgears, earrings and necklaces are worn during performances. The jewelry that is worn during Teyam, Yakshagana, Tirukut and Kathakali shows are statement making and awe inspiring. Such jewelry is often made using paper mache, cardboard, light wood and hollow metal. They are embellished with metallic paper, silver and gold foil, zari borders, tassels and glass stones. Nowadays, plastic kundan stones have become the embellishment of choice owing to its light weight and brilliant colours. Though these items are not commercially sold as costume jewellery, they are nevertheless important for they form an intrinsic part of our wearable heritage. Conclusion With this, we come to the end of this module. Through this module, I hope that I have given you an overview of the factors that influence jewellery design and the jewellery business. We have discussed the impact that human emotion, trends, culture and society have on jewellery. We have also listed out several techniques of jewellery making along with a short history of costume jewellery. This list is not exhaustive and likewise the module is not all inclusive. This module only seeks to provide an introduction to the language of jewellery to motivate you to read further. The following modules of this unit we will look in detail at the jewellery worn on the head, face, neck, body, hands and feet. I hope this would give you a stronger understanding of the jewellery segment.